Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our second live broadcast from the Toolkit Fiction Program. We're coming to you live from the Real Estate in Melbourne. Toolkit is a program run by Express Media, which is Australia's peak organisation for writers under 30. Um, we're a 12 week digitally based writing program, and we're currently midway through with our wonderful participants. But sessions like these ones with guest artists um, are live streamed so anybody can enjoy them and they can be immortalised forever on the World Wide Web. Um, Toolkits is just one of the many fantastic programs that Express facilitate, and um, this very weekend, in fact, they're off to Perth for the Tracks program. Um, so if you'd like to learn more about them and what they do, you can check them out on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. There may be an attractive, what do you call it on Instagram, a, a, a story, sorry, yeah, I don't use them, um, an attractive story featuring me and my instant coffee. Um, my name is Jennifer, I'm facilitating the Toolkits Fiction Program and tonight we are talking setting. I, we are incredibly fortunate to have um, one of my favourite Australian authors, Tony Birch, with us. Hello. Thanks for joining us, Tony. Thank you, Tony. Yeah, you're welcome. I feel like we're a morning television breakfast host. Okay, who's that coffee? Well, I've got <laughs> So like Carl and Lisa. Um, Tony is a multi award winning author and currently the um, inaugural Bruce McGuinness Research Fellow at Victoria University. His books include um, short story collections, Father's Day um, and Shadow Boxing, um, as well as his latest collection, Common People, which came out five seconds ago. On Monday. This Monday, just gone. Yes. Um, he's also authored a number of novels that you may have heard of, including um, Ghost River, the Promise and Blood, which is my personal favourite, um, and which was shortlisted, shortlisted. but did not win. The no, Miles, should have won. Should, should have won the Miles Franklin in yeah, 2011. <clears throat> um, Tony's also worked as a teacher, um, university tutor, um, academic, and you know, another public election. And in recent years, his research in nonfiction writing has um, had more of a focus around um, environment and climate change. Um, I could have had Tony in to speak about any number of things tonight, but. Um, one of the things I really love about Tony's writing is the way that he wraps up things like characterization, voice, um, dialogue, um, and sentence level um, beauty into setting, which is our topic this evening. So I thought we'd have a bit of a chat, a um, bit of a Q and A yeah. about setting and what it means to us as writers and as people. Um, as ever, please feel free to ask any questions you like. Um, you can jump on the Express Media Facebook or find us on Twitter. Um, just make sure you're using the hashtag EMToolkit. That's E-M, as in the letters, toolkits. Um, so, Tony. Yes? How do you decide where and when to set a story? Oh, well, there's, two, there's two ways. I mean, a lot of my stories, the setting is a, a non real life setting. So, that might be based on places that I've loved or spent a lot of time in, like the Yarra River, which is obviously central to the novel Ghost River. Or the particularly say with short stories, I may be walking around the city and there's something that will appeal to me about a location. So then I'll do some what I call observational work. I'm interested in how the place works, how it smells, the sort of people, that, the sounds and language that I pick up. So I do a lot of documentation. And then I take that home and use that as a sort of a backdrop or, or as you call the setting to, to the action. And I tend to, during the process of writing, in that instance, I'll go back and visit those places because I'm really interest, interested in the notion that um, the Nigerian writer Ben Oakley said that you know, the story is always happening in place and time, and we're part of that story. So I've often been pleasantly surprised when I revisit the places that I'm writing about that something will happen that seems to be an ideal fitting for the story I'm writing, as if it was there waiting for me. So that's that's one way, and probably for me the primary way. But if you notice, and particularly um, in this book, Common People, but in some of my earlier short story collections, I have this sort of mythical rural setting, which is like a rural town, a sort of often quite sort of wasteland type sort of towns. And I haven't actually visited that town. Um, and it's interesting, I sometimes revisit films that I really love. So that I was in Canada recently and I was looking through what was going to be on television and um, the last picture show was from my yes. favourite film of the early 70s. Also a great book. Yeah, a great book by Larry McMurtry. Mm -hmm. And when you know, I watched that film, I recognised that sort of sparseness and emptiness, the slowness of pace. So there is that mythical town that tends to reoccur for me in my settings. 
And there is a, a wonderful essay which is very influential, and people, if they want to find this essay, they can simply by Googling it. It's an essay called The Trigger in Town by a great American poet who's since passed, um, Richard Hugo. And Richard Hugo, who wrote a lot about the Midwest in America, these wonderful narrative poems, he said that what you do is you go to a town that you don't know, and you take the town that you do know to that new town. So you're not stuck with the reality of your experience and knowledge of the town you know. The new town is in some ways unfamiliar, but when you bring the unfamiliar and the familiar together, you get something that we might call fiction. So it's about using sometimes new places of which you use a template of experience. Yes. And that way that gives you the enormous freedom of, of not getting stuck in something that really happens yes. and this is the cliche. So they would be the the major ways that, that I work in relationship to setting. How do you how much do you sort of care about um, um, the similitude? Like how if you decide to set a story okay, so for instance in Common People, mm -hmm. um, I confess to only having read three or four stories oh, thus far. Why do you read the rest of them? Oh, sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well one one story that I have read is called Sissy and it's set in yeah. um, in Fitzroy, which yeah. is an inner suburban um, area of Melbourne, for those of you um, who might not have been here, and it's in the sixties. Mm -hmm. I know for you that is a an era and a place that has some personal resonance. Yeah. Um, was it necessary? How much research did you kind of do? Oh, actually, none. And in fact, that's interesting. That that story is revisiting some of the sediment through rain of earlier works, particularly my first book, yeah. Shadow Boxing. But in this instance, the setting, um, while important, is actually coincidental in a sense that that story is really about the central. That story is about skin, it's about a, a so-called mixed blood Aboriginal girl and the sort of fetishisation of young Aboriginal children who might be, you know, want to adopt or, or want to foster or take care of. So I would say though that as I'm visualising that story, I did visualise it as the picture that no longer exists. So I, I, I set the story at the beginning in the House of Welcome, which is still on Brunswick Street in Fitzroy, and when I imagine where the girl is living and imagine at one point the girls running around the corner to the next intersection. I do imagine the street that I lived in, which was behind Brunswick Street, which is which is no longer there. Um, in in that instance, I was confident of working with setting, but it would be one of the stories where the setting came quite naturally. And I, to be honest, I I didn't work at it or do any research on it. Um, I'm very confident. Well, I guess in part it comes from memory as well. So. In part it comes from memory, but um, it is interesting that you ask that question because I think it is relevant to say part of it does come from memory, but there is a moment in that story where the middle class woman who wants to take Sissy for a holiday comes around the corner in her car and she can't even park the car against the curb. She gets out of the car and stands on the roadway. In that sense, I did imagine literally that space between a veranda where a mother is staying and the distance between her and the woman on the roadway. So that moment I, I did have to visualise quite strongly because that's not coming from me. Yes. But it is using the setting of me to bring those two elements together. So in that sense you want it to work, you want it to be authentic. So even when you're creating fictional settings for me, as a pretty much a visual writer, when I imagine those children running or the, the car turning the corner, getting caught at the intersection, and then um, Sissy's friend standing on the intersection calling her, I do imagine that space in, in real time and in real distance. So for me, even as the writer, even though it may not be apparent to the reader, I need to be, be sure that I'm satisfied that the, the setting is true to the story. Yes. What about when you, um, like I know you've said, you sometimes write stories in places that don't exist necessarily. Mm -hmm. It sounds like they exist for you more in terms of um, mood or atmosphere, perhaps, mm -hmm. like in that sort of classic noir example yeah. or the Western example. Um, do you think we can write stories about places we've never been to? Well, uh, aside from your example of sort of creating a place. Look, in a hypothetical sense, I'd say yes, because I mean, any writer who is on, who's mm -hmm. writing well, your, your, your potential is endless, and I don't say that in any sort of arrogant way. Having said that, there, it's interesting that when I visited places where I would feel that I would want to write about, so one for me is I remember the first time I went overseas, I went to London, 
And I thought, I'll, I'll write a story set in London. Now, I've since been to London many times, and I have a daughter who lives in London. I'm very familiar with the city. But I've never once even been, you know, I've never, I've never had a niche I had to scratch. So there's never even been a sense of writing a story. Um, in regard to a story um, in this book called Party Lights, which is set in a, a sort of, again, a rural setting with two guys who are high on the most amazing drug that you could ever get hold of. Um, they come across a man in this sort of very desolate, almost desert part of the landscape, um, burying the house. Um, and it's interesting that that was a story told to me at an airport in, in Texas where a guy, when I said, what do you do for a living? So I bury houses. And he told me this story about going out into the wastelands of the, the Midwest, um, or West Texas, sorry, and being paid to bury derelict houses because it's cheaper than cutting them and taking them to a tip. Now, I wanted to imagine that setting, and although it's not West Texas, it's not a rural Australian town that I know. So it's about creating something where, yeah, you just start to think about those things of a, a, a quite empty, broad landscape. I was thinking about a big sky, mm -hmm. so take something very simple. And I think the key there, if you're going to write about a place that you don't know, is not to be too elaborate and too mm. descriptive. And I think it's much more vital to be impressionistic because that's all it really means if the story works. So let's say you wanted to write a story set on the London Underground. Now I've been on the London Underground too many times, it gets very claustrophobic. But if someone could YouTube a bit of underground footage and get a sense of it, yeah, you could do it. I think. The interesting thing is it's not if you can or can't do it, it's if you want to do it, which might sound odd, but I love the stories that are based on my interaction with place. Mm. So that, in other words, if you set me that exercise or if we set our students an exercise, write a story about a place you've never been to, some students would pull it up relatively well and some would fail and it could be me or you who fails on, on that occasion. The point being is that I'm not drawn to write stories based on a provocation. Mm. I'm drawn to write stories based on something that triggers uh, my excitement and interest based on something that's experiential. Yeah. Now, I don't know why it's the case when I've been to London, I haven't had a trigger, but the fact is I haven't. Whereas I could be walking, you know, I walked here from the, from the street tonight. It could have been the case that tonight I would have just seen something on Swanson Street that grabbed me and I think at some point now there's something there I want to write about. So it goes again back to the Ben Upward quote. I think for me and for a lot of writers, you're more drawn to writing stories which in, in a way you've been part of or well, you've been part of something that creates enough impetus to take that yes. setting further rather than, you know, I've taught students to say, well, you know, I can do this and I can do that. That's good if you can do it. I just love to do it differently. Yeah. And I think also, like, it's worth noting that, because um, I think I tend to approach things from a similar perspective. I think I enjoy writing more when I feel like I've got that sense of connection to to place. Mm -hmm. um, I've written a couple of stories in certain places that I haven't been. And what I would say about it is that it's really bloody hard work in terms of research. Um, I feel like my approach is maybe a little bit different to yours. I feel like I tend to over-prepare and mm -hmm. over-research and then it's a matter of knowing when to pull back and not put that detail in the story because nobody wants to have, you know, nobody wants to be bombarded by detail um, and sort of feel like they're getting the nitty-gritty. But I feel like it's almost, um, it's, it's, it's a real commitment that you make when you decide to write about a place that you've never been because I feel like even if um, you, you just want to get it right and you want to do it justice. Well, there are two things. I think you know, a bit of advice, firstly, would be if you're making two images, one's a photograph, so it's a very, like, supposedly realist interpretation, and that's all the detail is there. The other one is to think of an impressionistic painting. And for me, again, I think I'm more interested in the impressionistic painting because a good reader will gauge enough from that to create something that's yes. more tangible. The other thing would be that I don't think research is necessarily a bad thing, and I'm sure I'm sure that there are parts of my both my novels where I've done a lot of research. I think what the issue is there, if you imagine that material in front of you, let's say you might have notes, photographs, all sorts of jottings. What you've got to do when you come to the actual writing is push those to the periphery so that they're there for you. 
and you can draw them and bring them in, but they're not here dominating the yes. action. Yeah, so that, and particularly if anyone's doing what you might call historical fiction, um, you've got to be conscious of not putting too much of the sort of what I call sepia product mm -hmm. placement. Yeah, yeah. So to over-authenticate the story by whether it be language um, of the time, you know, use of control, yeah, yeah. Yeah. All, all that sort of stuff. Now, obviously you wanted to have that feeling, but it doesn't have to be so. And it, it's quite interesting that sometimes stylistically, as much as you try and write a period piece, people recognise the style as being a particular... More contemporary. Yeah, yeah. yeah. don't, don't realise. So sometimes with my work, people said, oh, say with Ghost River, yeah, people said they felt like it was set in the 40s. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know how they felt, I could sort of television, but, but the point is it's relevant because, and I don't say I look, obviously we didn't read the book probably there was television. Mm -hmm. I'd say what's interesting about that is that the kids in Ghost River and that setting along the Yarra River, which was so polluted and filthy at the time, is that it feels old because people, younger people today, probably don't recognise how impoverished the inner city mm -hmm. was until the early 70s and how much the Yarra River was a heavily polluted sewer yeah. for industry. So that change of the inner city, both demographically and physically and setting, mm -hmm. It's been dramatic in the last 30 years. So when people read that sort of material, they I can imagine that you feel it was much older. Yes. And that's just about giving people, I suppose, in some ways, and I don't mean in a didactic way, a sort of a bit of a, a historical education yeah. in how recent some of these changes to the city are. Yeah. We've got a question that ties into you were just mentioning before about, you know, your sort of you mentioned visual notes and things like that, mm -hmm. photographs. We've got a question from Jess L, who asks, um, what, is Hi, Jess L. <laughs> what is your writing process for mapping out a scene slash describing setting? Do you kind of use visual cues or? Um, it's interesting that um, you want to get it right. So it's something that I give a lot of thought to. So I do go through the series of questions. What does it look like? What does it smell like? What does it feel like? So we were talking before, and we heard the cars tooting outside to the noise of some people. But yeah, that's the sound of the city. So, you know, when you go out into the street, there's so many sounds. And of course, again, you're trying to capture them, you would think, which sound here might I use in the street that would capture a sense of the city? Would it be a car horn? Would it be a bicycle bell? Would it be something else? So, those senses, our senses, to me, play an important role. And again, not to overplay them, but to give the story some depth or volume, so that would be important. If I'm thinking about, and I think it goes to Jess's question, if I'm thinking about people in place, mm. I'm very much interested in how people move through a scene. So, you know, I don't just think of, you know, two kids walking along the riverbank and not think about how are they walking along the riverbank, how do they interact with each other. So there's a scene in Ghost River where um, where the boys, Sonny and Rena, are moving along the bank and um, Sonny has a, a, a golf club which he's using to slash through the, the weeds. Now, I could leave it at that, but yeah, here's a kid with a golf club. It's slightly menacing. And he, yeah, does he tease Rena with that? And, yeah, these two boys chase after each other. Do they go close to the water's edge, to the potential to fall in the river? So I think the main point that, for me is that when I deal with setting, I imagine it, if we might imagine a theatre space or a stage, and then when you put your characters in place, how do they interact with that space? And that's really important. So I actually, I actually choreograph scenes sometimes where if I have a character moving, I will practice that movement and you'll discover something. That's really interesting because I was just, I spent last I week. Me like I was no, 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 sorry. I was waiting to see, I was being polite and waiting to see if you were finished. I'm um, finished. Good, good. We should have a signal. We can okay. do several. I'll go on that. Okay. Um, I've actually got a few notes now. Last week I was teaching some school workshops with kids out in um, regional New South Wales areas. Mm -hmm. Went to Casino, Glen Ness, and Tenterfield yeah. for um, Fire and Writers Festival. And one of the things I was talking about in terms of character was. Um, we, we were workshopping writing and I was saying something that's dangerous is to make, uh, is to, you know when you sort of feel like as an author you're moving characters around the space? Yeah. And it feels quite mechanical. Yeah. And that's sort of the inverse of what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. But whereas I was looking at it as quite a negative thing, I guess you're talking about 
doing that quite skillfully. Like that choreography is very intentional. Yeah. And so that's like the, the perfect inverse or like the, the positive aspect of that. Well, but I don't disagree with your point either. It's that you should do it quite mechanically. Mm. Um, and maybe it is the case that what I, I, I'm, very ins I'm very interested in movement, physical movement. So when I do that choreography, I will think about how does it feel to, to wave your hand or how does, and if you can apply it, and I don't mean this in a sort of high form way, I, I apply it poetically, mm. you then get a sense of how movement is, is really important. I do have a tendency, I would admit, which goes to your point, I sometimes probably my characters move around too much and I think occasionally, particularly in the longer works, if I don't know what to do next, I just get in the go somewhere. Yeah. So, no, I do that too. I so, but I think I think your point about having an interactive environment, mm -hmm. like I'm thinking out loud, I think having characters interact with a space or environment is probably key to avoiding that sense of them just being shifted around, like the mannequins or like marionettes. Yeah. I'll give you a good example, and this goes to setting. So in my novel, Blood, mm -hmm. early on in the novel, there's a, there's a, a scene where with the mother, um, when who's, who's been drinking, gets really angry at her two children, Jesse and Rachel, because there's an accusation about them having different fathers and they start to nag their mother about you know, who their parents are. And when I was thinking of that, this is the very point, is that she gets so angry, she actually pushes her child, Rachel. Mm. And then when I think of that, so when I'm thinking of that, I will imagine Gwen and I pushing, so I imagine her hands that way, hitting that child in the chest. And then, of course, the next thing you think of, well, she's propelling that child, what happens next? So then I think, well, Rachel is behind the kitchen table, so she's near the wall. So then what happens is Rachel's body hits the wall, and when Rachel's body hits the wall, all the dishes crash off yes. the, the sink. And, it works because then you get a sense of that violence and carnage that you have this poor child who collapses on the floor, the mother standing in the, in the middle of the room, the centre of this violence and you know, broken glass, etc. So in that sense, that shows how movement is necessary. If you didn't do that, it would be mechanical. Yes. Because if you didn't do that, there is no action. There is no physical force. So I think in those instances it shows the importance of the choreography. The other thing in this is important for setting, I think, vital. If if you've got, and this is probably a good piece of advice for students, if you have that concern about characters moving in place, but in a way you need to contain them moving, because I was, I think, the very problem with race becomes apparent. I have a story in my first book, Shadow Boxing, called The Lesson, which is about a boxing lesson that a father gives his son. Now, firstly, I wanted to enhance the claustrophobic space of that because the boy is repulsed by what his father's doing. But when I came to write the story, I thought, how can I contain it? And what I did was, and it was from the outset, I imagined that the boxing lesson was taking place on a piece of lino, an old piece of lino in the backyard, and nothing was going to happen outside that piece of lino. So while I could have them moving about and physically interacting, I could also have them contained. So I've often taught this way, and, and you might know this from when we've had talks about this. I believe what I call the framing device the same way that cinema works. So even if I'm dealing with setting or space or place, I imagine it in a frame and I can contain the scene within that frame or the, the scene within a series of still frames that then move together. Because the point there is you can do those things of moving about, you can think of space as three-dimensional, but you have to contain it. Yes. And that I think that possibly avoids the, the issue that you're talking about yes. so rightly. So you can both work with movement, but you can work with it in a way that, in a way, you can control. Or even more than that, because you imagine it as a space where you see your characters in act, acting, you sort of have to control it. You have to find a way to visualise that for your reader. Yes. I think also that um, that camera metaphor is really helpful for um, thinking about setting in terms of, um, this is sort of hard to, I've never explained this out loud, but when sometimes I see um, new or beginning writers do this thing with setting where they're trying to 
do an expository bit to sort of introduce this session. Yeah. And so, like as an example, and this isn't anybody's work, but I'm, you know, I'm just making this up. If we're, um, yeah, <laughs> um, if we're say looking at a town square. Yeah. Um, I remember that story. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we they might be sort of moving erratically from yeah. you know the church spire to the yeah. cobblestones to um, an old woman in a marketplace yeah. to a dog, and I often try to get students to think about um, you know as if they were a tracking camera, either move from um, a wide angle shot to I'm going to get my, my film terminology wrong to a, to a sort of close up and and, and pan mm -hmm. on one thing. Um, or you know whatever it is to move from the the church steeple to to a ground to a floor level thing. Yeah. Um, sorry. No, no. I think what I think what that is, by the way, and I'm sure that I've been guilty of it. It's I think a right of compensating for the lack of confidence mm. in some ways. So you want to be sure that the reader really gets the setting, so you do all that stuff that you've just talked about. And I think part of it is not having enough faith in the reader's ability. Again. To see beyond the frame, yes. So that again, to be if you write very well impressionistically, um, a reader will fill in those spaces. Yeah. And, and we mustn't forget to use your town square analogy. As soon as you said a town square, I visualised a town square. Mm. It's not the same town square that you visualised. So you only have to do enough for the reader to find your own visual the reference reader. point. Yeah. Um, and that's why. You know, for, for young writers, and if we have any writers here who are in workshop, for instance, I know the way that workshop operates from many years of teaching creative writing, is that one thing you're entitled to as a writer is, is an intelligent reader. So therefore, it is a contract between writing well and expecting a reader to talk something best. And that might seem obvious, but sometimes readers say, I don't, I can't quite get it, I've never been to that yes. hands where. That's, not your, that's not your reader. Well, it's also a cop out of the reader. Yeah, an absolute cop out. So all you're looking at is to do enough that creates a relationship. So if you do a suburban backyard yep. setting, yeah, everyone has an image of a suburban backyard where they live in the suburbs or they've watched too much of neighbours or whatever. Yep. So you can't you can't erase that mm. with your your version of the backyard. You can only incorporate your version of the backyard into that. You get the sort of mashup. Mm. And it's still going to be different for everyone. And as a writer, you can't control for what no. readers no. might imagine or think. So I think you can work too hard. Mm. At, at, you can work too hard at literally sketching. Mm. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, yesterday, you sent through an essay just finished or finished recently. Um, and in it, you speak about being invited to attend. Or do you want to talk a little bit about what the essay is about, maybe? Well, the, the, essay, the essay is finished in draft form. I'm still working on it. But essentially, it's a, it's a personal narrative non fiction essay that I have written, um, partly based on my experience of going to that and the environmental creative center. So, I was working with writers from around the world on an environmental project um, called Frontline Environment. So I was there in one sense to write about um, the Adani proposed to Adani Palmer in Queensland, but I also was writing a personal essay, which in a sense, to put it simply, is reflecting on the comparative colonial histories of Canada and Australia, and in a way working on them with regard to the, the great difficulties that have occurred in both countries, the abuses of Indigenous rights and the abuses of Indigenous people in the country. But at the same time, the other major thread of the essay is in fact in both places to find stories of what I would call um, hope, where that I've been involved in, in both countries with people who I think are people who show us the potential to do things and act in a different way, whether it be about our protection of place and the environment, or whether it be about the recognition of yeah, the human rights abuses of indigenous people. So it was a to and fro in the essay where there are moments of great confidence that were then undermined by uh, moments of real tragedy mm -hmm. that I both was thinking about and, and witnessing. So that in both countries you have these, you know, it's, it's a sort of a, every time I feel, I do get that sense of hope and gave the people I, I have great respect for, you know, other writers, other creative people, um, there will always be something to set you back. So it's, it's in a way trying to negotiate that notion of how many steps forward and how many steps yeah. back you're taking. And hopefully you're taking more forward steps and backward steps. So essentially, 
that's what the essay was about. But it's also thinking about what we're talking about tonight. It's an essay really grounded in place. Mm. Stories of place that um, are both known, stories of place that are hidden or unknown, and stories of place that we can collectively invest in mm. and share. So that yeah, we all have experiences of place that we we have great affinity with, and it's about how those stories of day you can help us yeah, think differently about how we go to the planet. Yeah. Okay. In part of the essay, you talk about being invited to um, attend the Writers Festival in yeah. Christmas Hills, yeah. which um, was a community, one of many communities that was uh, devastated by the Black Saturday um, bushfires in 2009. Um, and you were one of several Aboriginal Australian writers invited to attend. Mm -hmm. Bruce Pasco um, with yeah. their and Alexis Wright yeah. as well. Um, would you mind if I quoted a small portion of the essay? As long as it's a good chance. Okay, well, you can tell me. Okay. You can, give, you can give me a signal if you want me to stop. Okay. Um, it's actually two passages, short ones. The organisers of the festival felt that a writers and readers day would help them to, sorry, then the community to recover from the pain they had experienced by being with the world through words and stories. They decided to invite a contingent of Aboriginal writers believing had vital things to say about loss, family, country, mourning and recovery. Then later in the piece, you receive a lift to um, the train station to go to coming back to Melbourne to go home with the next student's father. Mm -hmm. um, and there's this beautiful sort of linking follow-up passage to that, that initial part. Um, you're talking about this student's father. I listened to his warm voice, followed his hands resting on the steering wheel, and thought about how remarkable it is that people who have lost almost everything, be they the victims of a bushfire or Aboriginal people defending country their whole lives, find a way to recover. And more than recover, they are then able to extend generosity and support to others. Um, I reread that again and again because I just thought it was so beautiful. Are you able to kind of speak a little bit more about, and it's a huge topic, but about that kind of relationship that you have personally between, um, I guess, the that external landscape, like I know you grew up in in a suburban Melbourne and have lived here your whole life, but that landscape um, and your own personal sort of psychic landscape. Yeah, well, look, firstly, in regard to the first paragraph, which is relevant, I think what was remarkable about the day is that, yeah, the wonderful generosity the organisers had extended to us, um, and it was really something that I felt a great responsibility for when I got there, that, yeah, these people, were really hurting and they had asked us to come and work with them in a way that would alleviate that and, and get us to work together. So first I took that responsibility really seriously. But look, I've done enough public speaking, been in enough workshops, festivals. When I walked into the room, I just felt that there was an incredible sense of energy and atmosphere there. So I just felt it was really important to me to reciprocate. So it, it might, that might sound like a lot of things to start with, but I actually see that as a duty. Um, as a writer, that people are extending generosity to you. You're not there to just sort of walk through something, you're there to be part of something. So I took that very seriously. I felt that the opening addresses by two Aboriginal people who were on their own country at Torrenduk, David Wondon and his cousin, Brooke Wondon, their opening addresses to the large and more Aboriginal people were so generous. And the point here that's relevant to you are you're talking about psychic place, they come from a community who in the 19th century had almost all their country taken from them. Yeah. They were forced onto a reserve, they were treated appallingly, they were supposed to become extinct by the end of the 19th century. So the Wondon family harbour a history that if people were entitled to be bitter and angry and didn't want to engage, they would have that full entitlement. Absolutely. But they did the opposite of that. Um, David Wondon in particular, when he opened, he actually talked about the need to work together to share. And then Brooke, one got up and spoke in a similar way, and I think that had such an impact on the other Aboriginal writers there. It sort of put us, and when I say put us on notice, I said it in a very positive way that I then felt I owed my responsibility to David and Brooke to again reciprocate their generosity. Yeah. So, what it showed, and I talk of, when I left that there was this great microcosm of energy and hope in that day, it showed the potential where people work generously and intelligently with each other. You can get a lot of them very quickly. It's amazing. So that was the first thing. And when you think about setting, whether I was writing about that in a fictional or non-fictional sense, the setting of that room was, would be paramount to get a sense of that across to a reader. Um, then in relationship to the second point, again, it is about that notion that 
you know, here was a group of people who had gone through horrific loss, and I had personal experience of this group. A couple of very close friends who lost their houses, and unfortunately, a couple of students, mine, whose parents were, were killed in the fires. But again, the, the capacity of people who have gone through so much difficulty to reach out was such an offer of generosity that I felt that I could, I could not do anything but respond. And the point in that second passage that's relevant here is that this man who drove me to the railway station, try, me trying to think about what would I be like in this situation, which is beyond comprehension in some ways, I just marvelled at his, his warmth. I marvelled at his openness toward him. That impact on me. And you touch on, there's a, well, there's sort of a paraphrase quote. wants to look at his influence on YouTube or there's a video clip if you look at the film of Corrida it's K-O-R-E-D-A um, there's a lovely narration about his films and he writes about ordinary daily life he writes about place in Japan and the narrator says toward the end that for him the world is a difficult place yet to experience the world to be in the world is to understand how difficult he operates and when I say in this people chose to be in the world is that rather than their experience be something that cut them off from the world, their way of responding to their own trauma was to say, how do we deal with this? We have to work with other people. So it's a decision to be in the world. So that to me is probably the driving force behind most of my writing. So most of my writing is about people confronting difficulty and how you work through that difficulty. I think um, that is something else that a couple of years ago we were talking about, um, I don't even remember how we got onto the topic, but we were talking about um, sort of a lot of how a lot of contemporary Aboriginal Australian writers um, seem to be focusing on climate change. Um, and you know, we, we mentioned earlier um, Bruce Pascoe who wrote Dark in You, Alexis Wright who, uh, you know, the Swan Book was sort of this um, fantastical imagining of, uh, I don't know if you'd even call it speculative fiction, but it's beautiful. Um, and then, like Ellen Van Nieuwen, yeah. Heat and Light, the middle yeah. section of that. Um, and I think at the time, you, I don't know if you so was sort of hypothesising or stating that um, that Aboriginal Australian writers often sort of tend to reject this, um, I guess it's a predominantly Western notion of, or narrative of apocalyptic oh, yeah. climate change. Yeah. And you were talking, you said, I don't, I should bring it down, I didn't, sorry, but you had some great line about how, you know, for a lot of Aboriginal people, the sense is that we've already been through yeah. an apocalypse. Oh yeah, I mean, I, I find the, um, the whole notion of the, of the apocalypse really problematic. One is because I think that, yeah, we, as much as people focus on it, I think people, visual, they understand it's a fiction. So they've been through so many apocalyptic narratives and fiction film that there's, I think I did write an essay where I said, you know, whether it be consciously or not, in the back of people's minds, you know, Brad Pitt's going to come and save you, you know, Bomber or something, or, or you know, Rob Downey Jr. in the suit's going to come and save you. Are these your personal um, No, they're not. No, they're not, actually. Mm -hmm. But um, it is interesting that I think there are two, well, there are a couple of really important points here. Um, Murrow Johnson, who's involved in the fight against the Adani Colony with the Wangan and Jambalimu people, um, she gave a talk in Sydney last year. She said, um, we've seen the end of the world, we don't accept it. Yeah. So we, we reject your notion of it. And that's the first thing. The second thing is relevant to the fiction that you talk about. It's interesting that. For, for the West and for in Western democracies that came out of the Industrial Revolution, there is no going back to look at something to save you because the Industrial Revolution was, was itself destructive in the sense of what it did to the environment. So as you move forward, the potential for a problem becomes more apparent because you're not sure how you'll get out of it. In all of that fiction I just mentioned, what happens with Indigenous writers even if it's speculative or science fiction in the future, they find solutions by referring back to their ancestors. Yeah. So in other words, 
Aboriginal time, and Aboriginal time in the sense of pre European time, is where you'll find the value. So it's circular in the, in the true sense of that. It is much more a circular discourse. So that, that is the second point. And, and the final point is that, that I, I take your point that Aboriginal ways are often not writing about climate change as such, they're writing about country yeah. and protection of country as sort of it does encompass these challenges yeah, that we're dealing with. But it is the case that when you consider what we might be offered up as the potential hazards of climate change, so I mean, uh, there's pieces in the paper quite regularly. So if you do with this, there would be a piece in the Guardian at least once every couple of weeks. So scientists have discovered no, if we go two degrees above what we're currently yes. experiencing, um, this is going to happen, this is going to happen, this is going to happen. What it tends to say is we're going to lose access to water, we might lose access to land, we might lose access to A, B, C, and D. All of those challenges, Aboriginal people have gone through. Yeah. So many, many years Indigenous, yeah, advantage. Indigenous people all over the world have faced those incredible environmental, and physical, personal, destructive events and have found ways to to work through it. Now, there's been great, great loss with that, but if Aboriginal people had the same defeatist attitude that some people have when you hear about climate change, Aboriginal society wouldn't exist now. Mm. So I do get very frustrated and annoyed when people say, I don't want to hear about it, it sounds so terrible. Well, to me, it, it, it's a challenge that we have to face. Mm. Just a quick anecdote on this to give you an understanding. Yeah. When I was in Canada, the writers that I was working with in the environmental reportage um, residency, we were asked to present our work to the wider group of residents of that. And there were people there working in the literary fiction program, which is a separate yeah. program, which you should do. Mm -hmm. And um, when I walked out, a guy, an older guy, said, I must be so depressing doing what you do. And I said, what's that? Well, what happened? He said, yeah, writing about climate change in the environment must be really depressing. He's probably writing about something's marriage breaking. No, and what I said was, I said, actually, it's not depressing. If I wasn't writing about it, that would be really depressing. Oh. And to me, the fact that he was saying, he's not depressed about it because he doesn't think about it, yeah. was a very odd way to make a claim on me, doing yeah. something that made me feel miserable. And he wasn't feeling miserable because he wasn't close enough to reality. Yes. I mean, I think he was in a much more precarious position. Yes. Um, and if he's writing literary fiction, he's probably writing about, I don't know, I don't know somebody's what marriage breaking up. Yeah, a college yeah. professor in, you know, I don't know about college or professors. I was talking about. Yeah. Um, how much more time have we got? Not a great deal. We might take. A couple more questions. Yes, let's um, have a couple more questions. Let me see. We kind of covered a lot of this. We covered some good ground. Um, oh, here's a nice one. Who or what are you reading at the moment? Can you speak up? <clears throat> Who or what are you reading at the moment? Okay, who's that book? That's also from a Jess. Is that the same Jess? I don't know. I okay. suppose so. It Jess may well be. It might be Jess just really. Too. Okay, Jess. Um, exactly at this moment um, in, in the fiction area, I've just finished Kim Scott's new book, Taboo, mm -hmm. which I just think is, is absolutely sensational. I, mine just arrived in the post it's, yesterday. It's a remarkable book, and I was talking um, to Jen earlier. I have just finished or been reading. Um, Lucia Berlin's mm -hmm. um, A Manual for Cleaning Women, which is probably, I think, probably the best short story collection I, I've read. Um, the only thing, her voice is so strong that you do channel it. Yes, so I have the Yeah, those things that happen with writers. I, I have a, a story in my new collection called Worship, and it's a very poor man's Lucia Berlin. Mm -hmm. and often you don't realise that till afterwards, but it's fine. It's just saying this is how great this woman is, and uh, I love her fiction because. She's, um, the women are pretty wild, um, they're, they're out there. And um, I actually remember a line in worship where um, I'm dealing with a grandmother who's an alcoholic, but she's not drinking. Mm -hmm. And she said, yeah, I don't have that experience again. And someone says, what was that? She goes, well, I went to bed and Sydney and woke up in a motel in Ballarat. <laughs> now, that's definitely channeling yes. Bush of Berlin. Um, yeah, that's a whole Bush of Berlin story. Yeah, so, so 
um, they're probably the, the major two at the moment. Look, I read a lot of um, stuff on environmental studies and climate change, and I wouldn't um, point to a particular book, but I would say to people if you're interested in the subject matter, um, one thing about the area that I've moved into, there, there is really good writing. So beyond the speculative fiction, what's called yeah. Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi um, makes me feel really yeah. good. Yeah, it feels like a sort of sex Doesn't it? Yeah, I think does it? Oh, that's what I've always felt about it. Oh, well, thank God, because that's what I've always felt, but oh, I thought I was a pervert. Oh, me too. Okay, I think so, so much better. If it comes what the other thing we want the um, listeners or audience to come up is a new word for so climate, 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 which is climate, climate change fiction yeah, for yeah, those of right. you playing. So, the body of work around climate change, environmental studies in the non fiction area, mm -hmm. there's a lot of really good stuff. Um, if I were to recommend anyone, one of my favourite writers, Rebecca Solomon. I love um, that is wonderful in relationship to writing about. By the way, if you want to read a writer who writes well about place, landscape, environmental studies, Rebecca Song is probably problem. as good as or better than anyone. Mm -hmm. And I'm also reading um, Naomi Klein, who mm -hmm. I breakfast with in that. Nice and, name drop. Yeah, but she, she was wonderful, incredibly generous and incredibly ordinary as a person mm -hmm. in a great way. She yeah. was really just so down to earth. Um, that was not enough, her book on the Trump era. Um, she gave a public lecture that I attended. That is a really great political book where she, she hits every note yeah. with every page. So it's a great book. Um, we might have to wrap it up there. Let's wrap it up. Let's wrap it up. Okay. Many thanks for joining us this evening, Tony. It's been a pleasure, to I'm you. so glad. And thanks um, for everybody playing along at home tonight. And for your questions, um, the final guest artist for talk is fiction program um, is editor, poet and essayist extraordinaire Elena Gomez who joins us on September the 5th. Um, but for those who are interested in poetry, you can tune in to the Talk It's Poetry session on poetry and visual art, oh, a lot of poetry words, with Bella Lee and Melody Paloma, which is on 29th of August, my birthday. Um, this session, like all of them, will be available on Facebook. You've got real presents, Thanks, I'm being Lisa Wilkinson. Yeah. Um, so this will be available on the Express Media Facebook page and website if you would like to revisit any of our scintillating discussions from this evening. How did I go? Oh, you think you did good. Okay. Tony was worried because he didn't shave. I didn't shave. I'm going to shave next time. I didn't have a But I didn't wash my hair, so I, I reckon that's cool. All right. Well, that's, um, that's good night, nurse, from us. Have a fabulous night, everyone. Mm -hmm.